Bienvenidos a Data Latam, donde exploramos la industria de datos en Latinoamérica. Hoy tenemos una entrevista con Kit Miller. Kit está haciendo una maestría en informática urbana. Gracias a su interés en ciudades y mapas, decidió formar parte de esta innovadora carrera. La informática urbana promete ser la base para un futuro donde decisiones se toman con base en volúmenes masivos de datos. Kit nos habla sobre su experiencia de convertirse en un científico de datos. Además, nos lleva de la mano explicando su trabajo de investigación que le permitió construir modelos de predicción de la incidencia de incendios en la ciudad de Boston con base en datos abiertos. Escuchamos a Kit Miller. So I'm pretty new to data science, um, and I've arrived here in a pretty roundabout way. I s started off in college actually as an English major. I like to I like to write, and uh, you know I like to read, and uh, <laughs> it seemed like a good fit at the time. I didn't know what I was going to do, and you know after uh, I graduated, I it was uh, it was the dot com boom. Um, you know, started uh, not too long after I graduated, and uh, and so I got a little bit swept up in that. I started doing some uh, just basic web web development, you know, just learning HTML, and I also am interested in a lot of other things. And one of the things that I've always been interested in is cities and uh, geography and maps and data and research and all of these sorts of things. So um, I started uh, a project uh, sort of by accident. I was just, um, we were just brainstorming in class about possible topics for exploration with, uh, with a data set that we'd been given. And the data set was the tax assessors database for the city of Boston. And um, one of the things that it captured was uh, you know, the number of fireplaces, you know, really arcane pieces of data, like, you know, the number of fireplaces in a, in a residence and the type of heating that w was used and uh, uh, along with more um, conventional things like number of bathrooms and bedrooms and all that sort of thing. But, you know, we were just brainstorming about what, what some of this data could tell us. And I began wondering about you know, with the type of heating and the age of the building and the number of fireplaces and all these sorts of things. Well, what about fire risk? And, and so from there, um, I ended up doing a whole paper uh, and a presentation, at, you know, for my final project about predicting f fire risk based on data from the tax assessors database, along with some other data sets. And one of the most interesting uh, data sets that we that I that we had access to was uh, Boston's 311 data so the 311 system that they have for residents to report non-emergency issues that come up and uh, with that data set uh, you know you have citizens that are reporting issues related to you know uh, illegal rooming houses and uh, noise disturbances and garbage, uh, public issues of public and uh, private disorder, you know, related to a, a particular address. And, and when running some, um, some logistic regressions on the incidence of fire at particular addresses and the number of 311 reports for those addresses found found some pretty strong correlations between properties that had multiple incidents reported over a time span of a year, I think it was, and the, a later, uh, and you know, th those very addresses uh, were at a higher likelihood of having a fire later on. So. All of that, um, all of that kind of leads to, you know, I'm delving a little bit deeper into this fire prediction analysis and doing an independent study this summer to to dig deeper into it. Nice. 
super interesting. Actually, you mix, well, you said so many things there that we will need to unpack, but one that uh, I think it would be, uh, I mean, you are mixing data science, urban informatics, uh, open data, and open data is a big movement. Uh, and I think that you are one of the cases where you're really using a lot of open data. So why don't mm-hmm. we start there? How was it to, number one, get the, the initial data set, uh, and then being able to use the other open data sets that you found for city of Boston, and then maybe go for more, right? So leveraging on open data, how did that work? Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's a good question. So uh, the uh, the professor for this class, he he's been doing a lot of work, uh, a lot of research related to crime and three one one data as um, as it relates to uh, crime incidents of crime occurring in in given geographies. You know, at the at the census tract level and the neighborhood level and down to the, even down to more, most recently down to the address level. And so he had um, already the 311 data for the city of Boston. And that's also been made, you know, it's, it's open data. Um, it, you know, you can go to the city of Boston's uh, open data portal and download, download that 311 data. So that's, that's completely open. And um, and then also the tax assessors database. So, you know, that's also data that that was that you know he he had done a lot of a, a lot of sort of uh, work cleaning up the data and uh, and building a build, building a whole database that that made it easier to link different data sets with each other. But the the tax assessors data was you know, was made public initially, and then he did he did further work on it, or or you know, graduate assistants did did further work on it. So, so those two data sets, the the three one one and the tax assessors data, were completely open, and you know, made really made possible this kind of research, and have also made possible a lot of similar research that uh, this. Professor Dan O'Brien at Northeastern. Uh, so th- this this is work that has made uh, open data has made possible a lot of the work that he's done, and uh, and so a lot of the work I've done too. The the data that was not open um, that was a little bit of a challenge and continues to be a little bit of a challenge to get is is actual fire data. So. Uh, and that comes from the fire department, and um, you know that hasn't been made um, openly available on the data portal. So we we have to kind of go through back channels to to try to get at that. But um, you can, know, can, the, I, can I ask you? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can I ask you something practical about uh, integrating the data sets? Because I was mm-hmm. looking at the city of Boston um, um, open data portal. And I see that they have a field called uh, event location, mm-hmm. but it's a, it's a full address, so it's a, a house number and a street name. So how did you how did you, did you actually manage to to make sure that um, those addresses match the other one? Because I, I guess there will be uh, errors in uh, how the addresses are written down, perhaps, or is it all normalized before you receive it? Can you just um, uh, join the columns? How did you go about that? Yeah. So. So th- that's what I was I was kind of alluding to. So Professor O'Brien, he heads up the he's the research director for the the Boston Area Research Initiative, BARI, and that's uh, is located at Harvard. And um, so over the last uh, few years, um, they've done a lot of the data munging to uh, to parse addresses and to uh, Build up, um, build up a whole database of these different data sets that can be linked by a location ID. So, so the the data that's made available for download on the city of Boston's uh, data portal there, it doesn't have all of the the key geographic fields. I think they can 
that can help you know link locations with other data sets. So they have a, a you know a field called location ID. They also have X and Y, you know latitude and longitude coordinates, and a whole range of of other fields that allow you to to precisely locate the the records, you know, and so you can then map them, and then you can link the that data set with other data sets that also have a location ID. Quick question: So you get these tax assessors DB, then the Boston three one one data, then you re, uh, generate the results. Probably you presented that to the city, correct? Uh, were they interested? Uh, are there now next steps that the city is suggesting and you're collaborating with? How, how is that going after the initial success, if you want, of this project? Yeah, so uh, a great question. So I sent my paper off to the uh, some contacts at the citywide analytics team at Boston and... Um, they they've ex they've expressed definitely expressed an interest in the, the research. So the initial paper that I wrote um, it was was basically just a first step, and you know using multiple regression, you know we're finding correlations with incidents of fire and with uh, 311 incidents, as well as certain types of building structures like uh, triple-decker homes, the so-called uh, triple-decker homes that are common in Boston. Um, and to a lesser extent, uh, also with uh, the age of the building and, and so various other factors like that. And, and so, you know, the initial findings are, as I said, you know, just a first step, but they they are very interested in it, and what this is all um, leading to, you know, later on this summer, as I delve a little bit deeper and do some more rigorous analysis, is uh, I think what's planned is, you know, I'll write a longer paper about about my findings and then present to the city of Boston, you know, I guess to the key key people there that are uh, involved in the Boston Citywide Analytics team and, and others who are interested in this. So uh, my notion is that uh, kind of where this where this is going is that if we can identify areas uh, of the city that are at higher risk of fires, and, and that by areas, you know, might mean um, census block groups or census tracts, a lot of that data would be based on uh, socioeconomic factors um, because there are there's a lot of research that shows that certain socioeconomic factors are correlate with the greater incidence of fire so there's there's that and then but I, I think what's more exciting is the idea that you can you can pinpoint actual buildings, you know, through the use of, of the, the data that I talked about, you could pinpoint actual locations that might be at greater risk of fire and seek, uh, sort of uh, single those locations out for um, some sort of um, higher level of, of monitoring or, or even, you know, fire inspections. Uh, so you might have a list of high-risk properties that uh, that you need to to kind of monitor, you know, and uh, and check on uh, more frequently than you than you might check on uh, you know other buildings, and and this could help, you know, because uh, uh, you know in a city like Boston, you know, uh, you you have so many so many properties you can't. You know, there are fire inspections that are done when you do renovations, but they don't do, you know, I think ad hoc <laughs> inspections of, of or random inspections of buildings now. I don't think they probably have the manpower to do that. Um, so if, but if there were a list of of higher risk buildings, you know, that 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 could have an impact and that could cut down on number of fires and potentially number of 
uh, casualties from or injuries from fires? The the plan is to do um, a hierarchical linear modeling at uh, different levels of geographic speci speci specificity. So it, at uh, at a census block group level or at a census tract level, we're looking at different factors there. I mean, that's where you can get at the, you know, some of the demographic, socioeconomic variables that that might predict a higher risk of fires in in that area. And then uh, we'd also like to look at it at the street level, and and then even as I've said, of course, more specifically at the address level, and that's where you get at you know the building factors, primarily at that level. Fabulous, thank you. Yeah, it's so nice to see this. Uh, as we were saying, a minority report like for fires or for buildings. <laughs> this is pretty. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of a that's a, I, I guess sort of where it's where it's headed. But um, it's sort of along those lines. I, I just uh, finished reading a fascinating book uh, that was about um, actually sort of similar efforts to predict fires in New York City in the 1970s, and uh, it was quite a debacle. The they used uh, analysis from the Rand Corporation to to try to predict fire incidents and and look at they looked at response times with uh, different with different fire stations and they you know crunched all these numbers and and used this analysis to to close fire stations around the city uh, and the. The stations that were closed uh, were predominantly in poor neighborhoods, because um, because it was political politically uh, not feasible to close fire stations in wealthier neighborhoods. And what ended up happening is, is uh, you know, the, there was a tremendous epidemic of fires in New York City in the 70s, and there was a, a devastating fiscal crisis. And so with all of the you had uh, budget cuts and, and fire station closures, and and uh, the end result was that you know certain neighborhoods, uh, particularly the South Bronx, you know, much of the South Bronx simply burned down, and they they didn't have um, you know as they were closing fire stations, they didn't have firefighters to fight the fires there. So so uh, that's that's great background reading uh, for me because. Uh, you know, the, there's a risk of using data and analysis to. It's 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 one thing to kind of indicate areas of concern uh, for targeted fire prevention efforts, but it's quite another thing to use you know data analysis and to predict you know or to, or to uh, to actually make decisions about closing fire stations and and doing things that that can have a real Serious impact on on people's lives. So, um, just a cautionary tale. But um, yeah, the name of the book is called "The Fires" by Joe Flood, and uh, enjoyed reading it. It's, it's uh, and I, I think you guys would would enjoy it too. It's um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, we're gonna put it in the podcast notes for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. I think it's super interesting, and I think that the effort that you are undertaking now there in Boston, which is I would say one of the high-tech, uh, data-intensive, analytics-intensive cities in the world. Whatever we're learning from there, I think it can be extrapolated to other markets. And yeah, both yeah. your research, uh, the, the, the next phase of your research and this book and everything else, we're going to stay tuned to, to learn more about that. Let me ask you another question, Kid. Uh, for all the data scientists or data scientists to be here uh, in the region, which are the tools that you would recommend uh, people to learn to be able to do this type of studies with more and more data that is becoming available? So what, with your background, what you've done before and what you're learning now in the program, uh, 
what is it that you're using all the time? Uh, where, wh which are the key areas where people need to focus and which are the key problems that you need to solve when you're building the data pipeline? Can you please talk a little bit about yeah. that? Okay, yeah, so um, it's a pretty short list. Uh, you know, the caveat here is that I'm very new to data science and, and most of my exposure has been through these classes I've taken at Northeastern. And, and what we've used there uh, is R. Uh, R Studio uh, has been, you know, the, the, main, the main tool that I've been using to, to do the data analysis and, uh, you know, as part of that, you know, uh, doing visualizations with ggplot and, uh, and so, you know, it's all sort of within that, that R and R Studio of, of framework. Um, so, uh, you know, and I mean, the nice thing about R is that it's, it's open source and, uh, it's free, so and, and I understand it's very, very popular in in academia. So, I, you know, so it's it's sort of a natural fit for this kind of, I think, for this kind of analysis. And uh, you know, an, another possibility, I, I've done some Python programming, and I'd like to, uh, I, I I'd like to build up, you know. Uh, skills in both R and in Python for data analysis, but uh, as for the other tools, you know, it's uh, it's kind of a new world to me, so I don't have too many other recommendations. No, nice, and, but I think it's so powerful what you're saying because it's, it's so nice that today with more data available and just by being able to understand statistics and then use R uh, proficiently, there are so many things that can be done, right? Of course, asking the right questions to the data and then having the good sense of which other data to use, how to normalize it, how to create the data pipeline, but then you can do everything with an open source tool <laughs> that is out there. So that is really, I think, one of the catalysts of this industry growing and yeah, yeah it will continue growing. Yeah, I'll say I love our studio and uh, you know, I think it's a great, great environment uh, you know, an IDE for doing for doing R programming, and uh, you know, it's it's all free. You download it, and you can get up up and running. You know, pretty pretty quick. And you know, there's a bit of a learning curve, um, but uh, you know, this this syntax, the coding for someone like myself that's used to object oriented languages, and um, you know, it's it's a little strange, but uh, you get the hang of it pretty quick, and uh, it's so powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask you one last question? Uh, you talked about uh, the masters that you're doing on urban informatics, and I think that the urban informatics is pretty new. As you said, uh, you're probably the, the first generation of Northeastern with this program, and there's one at NYU and a couple more, but not so many. Can you talk about, I mean, I think it's amazing, right, what's going on with cities, uh, gentrification that we've probably heard a lot of times, uh, mm -hmm. available data and problems that need to be solved. So why don't you talk about uh, the program and then we will let you continue with your day, but <laughs> urban informatics, uh, what is it? Uh, why is it so cool and important and interesting? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question. You know, I think it's a, it's, it, it's a little hard to pin on what urban informatics is because it's an emerging field, um, but I mean, basically, as as I've seen it uh, defined and kind of as, as I see it, is that uh, urban informatics is the application of of data analysis and data science to uh, urban within an urban context in terms of solving urban problems. And helping to manage cities more efficiently. Um, within that, uh, you know what what we've been uh, kind of talking about within the program are some different themes, um, and that that urban informatics sort of encompasses. And and among those themes are um, 
open data is is important there. Um, there there are technocratic uh, policy innovations that come out of urban informatics. So um, you know these are things like uh, you know revolve around running cities more uh, efficiently. You have uh, Electronic sensors and in, in garbage receptacles in Boston that signal when they're full and uh, cut down on uh, wasted time. You know, I mean, I think that Boston is one of the epicenters of the data science movement. Of course, with California, right? Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. Having city of Boston leveraging on all these skills of people like you, I think it's smart and it's going to really give us in the world some good showcases of what can be done. I think that you did a fantastic job of explaining that to the two of us because we need to understand it. We're going we're gonna to probably be adding some Spanish context uh, to this podcast. So this is perfect. Man. Thanks a lot, Kate. Yeah. This, this was okay, great. thanks a lot, guys. Gracias por acompañarnos en nuestra exploración del mundo de ciencia de datos en este Data Latam Podcast. Cada dos semanas encontrarás un nuevo episodio en gatalatam.com o iTunes. Si te gustó este podcast, déjanos comentarios en Facebook.